My wife and I have been traveling for a couple, it's been the third Sabbath that we've been away from our home. Um, and because of that, we're in, we've been in a few more hotels than we're typically in, so I've been seeing a little bit more television news than I typically see. And um, I was hearing today that some people were estimating that in this uh, hurricane, this typhoon in Burma, that the death toll may pass the death toll of the tsunami. Um, if you've been watching the earthquakes, we were watching the earthquakes because when we fly into Reno, Nevada, when we come to the West Coast, because my son lives, lives in Carson, we typically borrow his car. So before we flew out there to start this trip, we were hearing about the earthquake clusters they were having in Reno. And since then, we've been hearing about all over California, the earthquakes that just keep happening more than normal. Um, where we live now, Arkansas, since we've been gone, I think it was eight people were killed as the tornadoes went through. That's just in Arkansas, I'm not talking about the tornadoes in the other parts of the United States. Uh, of course, there's wars raging. And Sister White says in Testimonies, Volume 9, that the leaders of the United States will be struggling in vain to put the business operations on a more secure basis, and that's the topic of the news. Uh, biggest bank in the world is in the news today. Citibank is going to try to sell off $400 billion worth of assets um, because they're trying to put business operations on a more secure basis. Whereas when Sister White's making that statement in Testimony in Volume 9, she's referencing the soon coming Sunday Law and Daniel chapter 11. And it's in that passage where she says the final movements will be rapid ones. Um, so I hope that as we begin this, these presentations this week, that we're all on the same wavelength. The testimony of the secular press tells us that all the things the prophets said would be taking place at the end of the world, they're here, they're taking place. Um, if you didn't receive a handout, Brother Rahman in the back, Brother Rahman is a friend of mine for over a decade now. When we went to South America in the past, it was always Brother Rahman that would do the advanced missionary labor to prepare meetings as we would go to meetings. Sometimes he'd go there three or four months in advance and live with the people and three or four months later we'd get there and there'd be meetings set up. So Brother Ahmad is an old friend. If you don't have handouts, he has some. Um, the direction that I hope to go this week would be to look at um, some of the truths that are represented on those two charts on the wall. The chart on the left is the 1843 Pioneer chart. The chart on the right is the 1850 Nichols chart. Uh, we'll say some more about those this evening. Um, those charts represent the foundational truths of Adventism. And I would say right here that here we are at the end of the world, that there's a Seventh-day Adventist teacher that isn't teaching things that are connected to the foundational truths of Adventism, you need to be highly skeptical about whether the Holy Spirit is directing you because one of the works of God's people at the end of the world is to return to the foundations. Um, and that's going to be one of the things that we try to put in place for us here this evening. Uh, we're also going to have to put a couple more things in place before we begin our study in earnest tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to demonstrate very easily, we've been sharing this for quite some time now, um, that every reform movement in sacred history is identical to every other reform movement, and they all prefigure the development of the 144,000 in the final reformation of Earth's history. And not only are there parallel histories, but this is a truth that those that are the candidates to be the 144,000 must understand. So, I, I, I put these together in the hotel room this morning, and we went over to Office Depot or whatever and had them printed out, and I forgot to tell it to put page numbers on it. Page number one is the one that says, no new message. I would like to begin on page number four. So if you just turn it over backwards, I, on page number four, there's some points to make later on, but I want to start there and go back to page number one. Um, in the, the second quote on the last page, and the second quote has two paragraphs in it. It 
It's from Signs of the Times, June 21st, 1883. I just want to read part of the second paragraph in the center of the page, page four. It says, there was a present truth, a truth at the, that time of special importance in the days of Christ, of Paul, of Luther. There is a present truth for the church today. But truth is no more desired by men of today than it was by the Jews in the time of Christ or by the papists in the days of Luther. Therefore, Satan, working now with tenfold greater power, succeeds as old in blinding the eyes of men and darkening their understanding. There will be, there is, a present truth message for Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world, which Satan is attempting to prevent from being understood by Seventh-day Adventists. And those people that are trying to block the present truth message from being understood by Seventh-day Adventists are not Baptists, they're not New Agers, they're people in Adventism. In Adventism, there will, there is a present truth message, and Satan is working ten times harder today to prevent Seventh-day Adventists from understanding what that message is than in any other time in this history. The last quote on that um, page from Acts of the Apostles, page 11, says, In every age the Lord has had his watchmen who have borne a faithful testimony to the generation in which they lived. These sentinels gave the message of warning, and when they were called to lay off their armor, others took up the work. Now, these quotes deal with more than one subject here, but then more than the subject that I want to address here, and perhaps we will get back to these quotes later on today, or at least in this week, because we're going to deal with the watchmen at some point in time, Lord willing. But what I'm suggesting to you is that there is a present truth message for Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world, and it will be a message of warning. The present truth message for Adventism is a message of warning, and there are several passages that bear that out. This is just one. So if you go back to page one, we will begin. Um, I'm submitting to you that I would hope that as you consider what we share here this evening and throughout this week, that you would put it to the test and see if it is the present truth message for this generation. If it isn't, you shouldn't spend your time pursuing it. Sister White says there's many wonderful truths in the Word of God, but what the flock of God needs now is present truth. And here we are, just before probation closes. We don't need to be spending our time on truths that are truths, but aren't the warning message that's designed to arouse God's people at this point in this history. So what is our message? In the top of page one, the pages are not numbered, under the title, No New Message, it says, God is not giving us a new message. We are to proclaim the message that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the other churches. We don't have a new message. We have the same message that the Millerites had. The message that they proclaimed before October 22nd, 1844. The next quote. God bids, bids us give our time and strength to the work of preaching to the people the messages that stirred the men and women in 1843 and 1844. Next quote from General Conference Bullets in April 1st, 1903. says, Those who stand as teachers and leaders in our institutions are, are to be sound in the faith and in the principles of the third angel's message. God wants his people to know that we have the message as he gave it to us in 1843 and 1844. By the context of this passage, the message of 1843 and 1844 has a direct connection to the third angel's message. We can't separate it. Even though the third angel's message did not arrive until October 22nd, 1844, and when it did arrive, the Millerites at that time period didn't understand it. So they, they didn't understand it for a while. And the reason that I'm just saying that it arrived on October 22nd, 1844, is because at that point in time, Christ moved into the most holy place, and by faith, the person could move in with him and see the Ark of the Testament, <coughs> and see the Ten Commandments, and see the Sabbath, and understand the relation of the Sabbath and Sunday issue in the Third Angel's message. But on October 23rd, 1844, the Millerites did not understand that. But the Third Angel's message had arrived. And whatever the Third Angel's message is, it has a connection to the messages that were proclaimed in 1843 and 1844, according to this quote. Next quote, um, 
The manuscript releases volume 12, page 437 says, all the messages given from 1840 to 1844 are to be made forcible now, for there are many who have lost their bearings. These messages are to go to all the churches. Amen. Christ said, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Blessed are the eyes which saw the things that were seen in 1843 and 1844. The message was given, and there should be no delay in repeating the message, for the signs of times are fulfilling, the closing work must be done. A great work will be done in a short time. A message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. Then Daniel will stand in his lot to give his testimony. Now, if you will, one thing that I'd like to point out to you, and I'm often amazed at things that that I take for granted, that, I, that all seven day I'm going to understand, and then when you state them matter-of-factly, so you find that some people do not understand them as clearly as you, and I guess there's a potential that maybe you misunderstand them. That's why they don't understand. But my point is this. The loud cry of the third angel. Sister White here is talking about the loud cry of the third angel, and she's saying somehow, some way, Whatever the message of the loud cry of the third angel's message is, it's connected to the messages that were proclaimed in 1840 and 1844. So what is the loud cry of the third angel? Just prophetically, to be technical about it, and, and you'll see, if you can remember what we're saying now, at the end of the week, you'll see why I'm trying to be technical. The loud cry of the third angel's message takes place when the mighty angel of Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, comes down and joins the third angel's message. Okay, and then, now, I, we, I'm not denying that Sister White says the message of Jones and Wagner in 1888 was the beginning of the loud cry of the third angel. But if you're going to look for the beginning point of the loud cry of the third angel's message, you can even go back to October 22nd, 1844, because that's when the third angel's message began, and it, it began its swelling. And the Lord wanted to empower it in 1888, but we decided that we wanted to spend some time wandering in the wilderness of sin. But technically, prophetically, the loud cry of the third angel's message takes place when the angel of Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, joins with it. That's how we've understood it in Adventism for 100, 100 years. But sometimes we don't think about it. But we want to think about that because if you notice, I'm saying verses 1 through 3. I'm not saying verse 4 of Revelation 18. I'm purposely making a distinction between the first three verses of Revelation 18 and verse 4. Lord willing, we will be with that later. Next quote under studied and proclaimed. <coughs> The truths that we received in 1841, 1842, 1843, and 1844 are now to be studied and proclaimed. The message is that the first, second, and third angel's message will in the future be proclaimed with a loud voice. They will get, be given with earnest determination in the and in the power of the Spirit. Once again, she's identifying the messages of 1841 through 44 as having a direct connection with the loud cry of the third angel. If someone's going to teach you uh, the, what the message of the hour is in connection with Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, then they're going to have to have some be teaching you some connection with that passage, with the messages that are reflected on those two charts, because the messages that were proclaimed in 1840 to 1844 are the truths that are represented on those two charts. If they're not doing so, they're missing the foundation of that message. I'm not a I'm not a trained speaker, but what I was is. I worked in construction with my father, and when he retired, I took over his business, so I, that's, that's what my trade is, is construction. You don't have to be in construction to understand that if you don't have a foundation of a house, even if you build a house, it isn't going to stand. If you don't have that foundational truth connected with the message that you're suggesting is the present truth message for Adventism at the end of the world, whatever you're teaching is not going to stand. That's the foundation. That's where we're headed. <coughs> The, the chart on the left there, the 1843 Pioneer chart, you'll see the quote that you're probably familiar with from 
I'm really writing to page 74 that says, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. And then in 1848, correct me if I'm wrong, but in 1848, Sister so Joanne has a vision. 49. Okay, 49. Where she is instructed to tell her husband to produce a new chart to correct the error on the 1843 chart, which is the chart on the left. And in 1850, the corrected chart is produced. That is the chart on the right. Sometimes it's called the 1850 chart. Sometimes it's called the Nichols chart. And it, you'll find that the correction on that chart is simply the year zero. They're ending the 2300-year prophecy on the chart on the right in 1844. Whereas the 2300 year prophecy on the 1843 chart, of course, ends in 1843. The reason it's called the 1843 chart is it's predicting the end of the world in 1843. It was produced in 1842. And okay, that's, that's why it has that name. Notice the next quote, because it's referring to the chart on the right. It says, I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. How many of you knew? that the chart on the right, that there's a prophecy of that chart in the Bible. I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible, and if this chart is designed for God's people, if it's sufficient for one, it is for another. And if one needed a new chart painted on a larger scale, all need it just as much. Both of those charts have the inspired seal of approval upon them. Even though the chart on the left had some figures, that were misunderstood, that the Lord held his hand over. Nevertheless, the chart on the left was directed by the hand of the Lord, and God was in the punishment of the chart on the right. If you were going to, um, concerning the chart on the left, the 1843 chart, if you were going to make the case, as I'm doing here this evening, I'm going to try to help you to see if you haven't considered it before, that the foundations of Adventism, the foundational truths of Adventism, are the truths that are represented on that chart. If you're going to make that argument, one of the arguments that you'll make is that the pioneers understood that the chart on the left was produced from the Bible. The Bible is what directed them to produce that chart. Sister White says so in the Great Controversy. She says from Habakkuk 2, they were led to produce that chart. And that chart is what got them through the first disappointment. And therefore, the claim I'm making here tonight is that the foundational truths of Adventism are the truths that are represented on that chart. One of the arguments that I want to bring to bear along that line is the pioneer understanding of that very subject. And you'll notice the next quote isn't Sister White, it's James White. It says, it was the united testimony of the Second Advent lecturers and papers when standing on the original faith, that's the foundational faith, all right, when standing on the original faith, that the publication of the chart was a fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and 3. If the chart was a subject of prophecy, and those who deny it leave the original faith. If you deny that the chart on the left was produced by the Lord at his direction, then you've stepped off the platform of Adventism. And the chart on the right, there's a prophecy of that chart in the Bible, and God was in the publishment of that chart. On the bottom of the first page, you'll see the passage, one of the passages that led the, the Millerites to produce the chart on the left. Habakkuk 2, verses 1 through 4, says this, and you know, the reason that, that I have the word watch set me upon the tower and watch in bold face on here, <coughs> Lord willing, in, during this week, we're going to go through and look at the watchmen on the wall during the walls during the time of the Millerites and the watchmen on the walls here at the end of the world. It is a subject of prophecy. And it's very enlightening when you walk through and look at it. So I have that highlighted for the purpose of, of helping us see that. It isn't what I, the point I want to make here, but let's read the back at 2, 1 through 4. You can read it from your Bible, or you can read it right there off the page. Bottom of page 1 says, I will stand upon my watch 
and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. From that statement, the Millerites were convicted that they needed to take the truths that they were proclaiming and put them on that chart on the left. Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he that readeth it may run. But you, there's a mistake on that chart, right? And what is this, the mistake? The year zero. The first disappointment. And first, when did the first, when did the first disappointment come? That's a trick question, all right? Because usually when you ask that question, everyone will say, well, the first disappointment was in 1843. And that's okay. That was the prediction that they were making. But it really wasn't 1843 the way we look at it. The Millerites were using the biblical reckoning of time, and they understood that the year 1843 ended on March 21st. So the first disappointment, the disappointment that we call the disappointment of 1843, actually arrived on March 22nd, 1844. And suddenly, what they'd been predicting, you shall see, there was suddenly a thousand pound boulder put on their shoulder, but the Lord led them back to this very passage in Habakkuk that led them to produce that chart. And you'll notice the next four portion of the of Habakkuk says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. They realized that there was a tarrying time that they had not recognized before. And those people that were in the world opposing the Millerites, when, when 1843 had passed, what they were saying is, You guys were lying. And this passage says, this vision does not lie. Wait for it. There's an appointed time. It's going to come. So this, this is the passage that not only directed them to produce that chart, this is the passage that encouraged them through that disappointing time. Now, on the next page, you'll see the other passage that Sister White points out in Great Controversy that the Lord used to lead them to produce this chart. And this, this, is worth reading also. This is from Matthew 12, verses 21 through 28. I'll read it through and then and make a comment on it for a later presentation. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is the proverb that you have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision fell in? Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease. And they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say unto them, The days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. For there shall be no more any vain vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall no longer, it shall be no more prolonged. For in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word, and will perform it saith the Lord God. Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, The vision that is that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesy of times that are far off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord God. And you'll notice, in, if you're reading it off the notes I handed out, that the part I have highlighted, or the bold face there, which isn't in the Bible, I did that, is for in your days. So what I'm suggesting to you is that the two passages of scripture that the Lord used to produce the 1843 chart on the left, that one of the things Ezekiel is saying is that in the time of the Millerites, the message that they were proclaiming would be fulfilled, and it was. What they, what they were predicting was fulfilled in their days. I'm making that point because, Lord willing, we will look at Luke 21 while we're here. And in Luke 21, there is a second witness to this where um, Jesus says in Luke 21, those who see these signs, this generation shall not pass. Right? So I just want to put this in our memory bank for when we get there. That when... When, this, when the Miller, and I haven't made this point. One other point we're going to try to get to this evening, probably not get there, but maybe tomorrow morning, 
is that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world. Once you've established that, once you can see that, then what we're saying about those charts, those charts, the chart on the left was part of the history of the Millerites, and therefore when that Millerite history is repeated again, there is the possibility, the probability, in fact, it is so that this chart will become present again in a different way. The Millerites, the chart was an evangelistic tool. For us, it's going to be a tool that Lord uses us to lead us back to the foundations of Adventism. But when that time arrives, when the Lord begins to once again place an emphasis on that chart, then he brings with it the passage from Habakkuk and the passage from Ezekiel 12. And it's saying that in that time period, when this chart once again becomes a component of present truth, that in those days of that generation that is living, the message will be fulfilled. And this is what Luke 21 says. This generation shall not pass. We'll get to that, Lord willing, this week. We're just trying to put some planks in place for the coming meetings. Um, what we're suggesting is that the and some of you that came in a little bit late, please, if you got a handout, read the where we started. God isn't giving us a new message. We're to continue to present the things that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the other churches. There were how many Millerite preachers? 200? How many of them used the 1843 chart? It's the only message they were proclaiming. So when we're told we don't have a new message, we're to present the message that they were preaching in 1841, 1842, 1843, and 1844, saying our message is the message that's represented on those charts. And the reason I'm saying those charts is the only difference between those charts is the chart on the right, the 1850 chart in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see symbolically represented there the understanding of the sanctuary, which they did not have on the 1843 chart. But the sanctuary was the earth. And they have the year 1844. That's the only difference you'll find on those charts. That's the messages of 1843 and 1844 that is our message that is connected to the third angel's message that is part of the loud cry message. And in the next quote, we'll identify as the foundation of Adventism. From Review and Herald, April 14th, 1903, it says, May God help you under the title, The Foundation and Platform. May God help you to receive the word that I've spoken, that those who stand as watchmen on the walls of Zion be men who can see the dangers before the people, men who can distinguish between truth and error, righteousness and unrighteousness. The warning has come. Nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of the faith upon which we've been building ever since the message came in 1842, 1843. 1844. The message that came in 1842, 1843, and 1844, Sister White calls the foundation of the faith. It's the foundation of Adventism. The next sentence says, I was in the message, and ever since I've been standing before the world, true to the light that God has given us, we do not propose to take our feet off the platform. This message that's on these charts is the foundation and the platform of Adventism according to Sister White. <coughs> I hope that we all have strong confidence in the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. Amen. Amen. We do not propose to take our feet off the platform on which they've been placed as day by day we sought the Lord with earnest prayer, seeking for light. Do you think that I could give up the light that God has given me? It is to be as the rock of ages. It has been guiding me ever since it was given. The message that is represented on those charts, according to Sister White, is the foundation and the platform of Adventism. In Isaiah 58, 12, and I have heard many times, and I've been asking this question now for a few months at least, I have heard in my years in Adventism that the passage in the Bible that Sister White most often refers to is Isaiah 58. If there's a spirit of prophecy scholar in here that wants to correct me, please do. I'm putting this on a lot of tape. But even if it isn't, she refers to Isaiah 58 over and over again. And Isaiah 58, 12, as you have in your notes, 
He's illustrating the works of, of God's people at the end of the world. Now, I didn't, I didn't do some preference, preference. Didn't do some uh, lean-in thoughts that I sometimes do. Uh, that being that in First Corinthians ten eleven, um, all these things happen as examples of the end of the world. I didn't take the time to go through a quick little Bible study and a couple of them white folks to teach that all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. But that's very clear in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So when you understand that, Isaiah 58, 12 is speaking about the end of the world. It's easy to identify that. And it's talking about God's people at the end of the world. And God's people at the end of the world in the book of Revelation are identified as 144,000. They're the remnants. So Isaiah 58, 12 is speaking about at least one aspect of the work of the remnant people of God, the 144,000. And it says, and you have it in your notes, and they that shall be that of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorers of past to dwell in. Lord willing, tomorrow you will see the foundations of many generations raised up. What we're talking about here tonight, though, is the foundation of Adventism, the generation of the Millerites. That foundation, and the 144,000, one of the the works that they're going to do is they're going to raise up the foundations. And the reason that they're going to raise them up is because the foundations have been forgotten or attacked or misrepresented. But they're also going to be those that restore the past to dwell in. And 1 Corinthians 14.32 says, The spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. And the next verse says, For God is not the author of confusion. The spirit of the prophets is subject unto the prophets. One thing that means is that if Isaiah is saying something about the end of the world and Jeremiah is saying something about the end of the world, they're not going to disagree with one another. They're subject to one another, for God isn't the author of confusion. Amen. So when we see that Isaiah is saying that the 144,000 in Isaiah 58, 12 are, 12 are going to restore the past to dwell in, if we go to Jeremiah 6, 16, and 17, we can find out what the past to dwelling are. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Brothers and sisters, the past that we're to dwell in, the past that are going to be restored by the 144,000 are the old past. They're the, the foundational truths of Adventism. And the Lord will raise up watchmen that understand these truths. And the watchmen that he raises up will have something to say about the trumpets. Brothers and sisters, if you think I'm making a stretch there, the Millerite history is repeated. We're going to show you that as we proceed. And the message that the Millerites presented is represented on those charts. And they had a very clear message of the trumpets of Revelation. In fact, the prophetic truth that empowered the Millerite message was a message from the trumpets. The watchmen of the Millerites, they had a message from the trumpets that empowered it. And I submit to you when that history repeats, the watchmen in Adventism at the end of the world are going to once again have a message from the trumpets of Revelation. But you'll only see that message if you maintain the foundational understanding of Adventism. Jeremiah 18, 15 says, Because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense of vanity, and have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient past, to walk in paths in a way not cast up. I submit to you that we're walking in ways today in Adventism that aren't kept up. How many are on our mailing list? Raise your hands high. So I said, okay, we have a thank you. We have a, a newsletter that we sent out for this month. This is for April. This is, this is May for last month. And in that newsletter, brothers and sisters, whether you realize it or not, I, I, I'm going to walk over there just for a second for those of you that are running the camera. Do you want me to get it? 
No, if it's important to you, it's not necessarily important to me that we're on the camera. But in the newsletter, no, thank you. You can show that today in Adventism, and I'm not being critical of the church, I'm trying to be accurate to the prophetic history that we're in today. I have, a, I have an email, it's in the newsletter from the Biblical Research Institute, that rejects the pioneer understanding of the trumpets, specifically, directly. It rejects the 2520 time prophecy. They've already rejected the daily. And brothers and sisters, you can show, if you reject the pioneer understanding of the daily, that you reject the 2300-year prophecy. But also, if you're incorrect on the daily in the book of Daniel, which identifies the year 508, then you can't make any sense out of the 12 men in the 1335 of Daniel 12. And where we stand today, brothers and sisters, is we're walking in paths that aren't set up, and we're supposed to return to the old paths, the foundations of Advent. <coughs> so you may not be aware of it because you haven't been looking at it, but the reality of it is, is the Seventh-day Adventist Church needs to evaluate what they understand about Bible prophecy here at the end of the world, because what we're being taught is in complete disagreement with what was taught on those two charts that have been endorsed by inspiration and being directed by the hand of the Lord. The next quote says, oh, before I move past Jeremiah 6, 16, which is the previous one that I read, notice that there's going to be an argument about this. Whenever, whenever we reach the end of the world, and the watchmen, whoever they are, begin to agitate the idea that we need to return to the old paths, and we need to raise up the foundation of many generations. Um, in verse 17 of Jeremiah, it says, But they said, We will not walk therein. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. There is going to be a controversy concerning this work of returning to the foundational truths of Adventism. The controversy isn't just between the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and whoever the watchmen are. The controversy is going to go all the way down from the head to the toe. Um, we lay people have our own strange ideas that we may not understand are a direct contradiction of the foundational truths of Adventism. And if we won't surrender them, we're going to be lost. Bible is very clear. The watchmen at the end are going to be eye to eye. They're going to have the same message. They're going to be in unity. Now, why do I say we're going to be lost? Early writings, page two fifty nine. Here's the next page. I hope that you all assimilated the, the quote on the previous page under the foundation and platform where, where Sister White plainly says the message that came in 1842 and 1843 and 1844 is the foundation and it's the platform. Because in early writings, page 259, you have one of the warnings from the spirit of prophecy about the foundations and the platform coming under attack. So she's not going to disagree with herself. When she's talking about foundation and platform. She's talking about the messages that came that are represented in the Millerite time period that are represented on those charts. So let's read this together. I saw a company who stood well guarded and firm, giving no confidence to those who had unsettled the established faith of the body. Those charts represent the established faith of Adventism. According to James White, if you don't accept that, you've left the original faith. God looked upon them with approbation. I was shown three steps, the first, second, and third angel's message. Said my accompanying angel, woe to him who should move a block or stir a pin of these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of vital importance. The destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. I was again brought down through these messages and saw how dearly the people of God had purchased their experience. It had been obtained through much suffering and severe conflict. God had led, led them along step by step until he had placed them upon a solid, immovable platform. I saw individuals approach the platform, platform and examine the foundation. Some with rejoicing immediately stepped upon it. Others commenced to find fault with the foundation. They wished improvements to be made, and then the platform would be more perfect and the people much happier. 
Some stepped off the platform to examine it and declared to be laid wrong. But I saw that nearly all stood firm upon the platform and exalted those who had stepped off to cease their complaints, for God was the master builder, and they were fighting against him. They recounted the wonderful work of God, which had led them to the firm platform, and in union raised their eyes to heaven, and with a loud voice glorified God. This affected some of those who had complained and left the platform, and they with humble look again stepped on it. And you can't I can't make this claim here from this one paragraph, but for me, based on other passages that I'm not prepared right now to bring to it, when she's giving this description, even though this description in the Millerite history, you can show where they stepped off the platform and got back on it and began to encourage people to get back on the platform. That's part of the very beginnings of Advent history. Um, the majority of them stepped off for good was in a meeting in 1846. Was that in Albany? 45. 45. But nevertheless, the prophets are speaking more about the end of the world than the days in which they live. So I'd submit to you that when you bring this passage down to our day and age, um, that when the, in the second to last <coughs> sentence, when it says, in union, raise their eyes to heaven with a loud voice glorified God. This is talking about the loud cry of time period when God's people return to the foundation of the message. In any case, there is a warning here about the foundations and platforms coming under attack. And what I'm submitting to you here, brothers and sisters, is that this particular message, the foundational message and the truth connected to it, it's a testing message for God's people here at the end of the world. Why do I say that? I say that for a variety of reasons. I also say it purposely because I know lots of people do not want to hear me saying that there's a prophetic message at the end of the world for God's people that is a testing message. I've watched men and women stumble over this, and you can't hide from this. So we're going to put it right off in the open right from the start. Here is a prophetic message, a present truth message for God's people at the end of the world. It will come from prophecy, and it will test that generation. One of the reasons that I say that is because of this passage. We just read this paragraph. Now notice the next two paragraphs. <clears throat> I was pointed back to the proclamation of the first advent of Christ. John was sent in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way of Jesus. Those who reject rejected the testimony of John were not benefited by the teachings of Jesus. Their opposition to the message that foretold his coming placed them where they could not readily receive the strongest evidence that he was the Messiah. Satan led on those who rejected the message of John to go still farther to reject and crucify Christ. In doing this, they placed themselves where they could not <coughs> receive the blessing on the day of Pentecost, which would have taught them the way into the heavenly sanctuary. The rending of the veil of the temple showed that the Jewish sacrifices and ordinances would no longer be received. The great sacrifice had been offered and had been accepted. And the Holy Spirit, which descended on the day of Pentecost, carried the minds of the disciples from the earthly to the heavenly, where Jesus had entered by his own blood to shed on his disciples the benefit of his atonement. But the Jews were left in perfect darkness. And what I want you to see here is Sister White talks about the platform and foundation of Adventism which she's already defined in other places as the messages that are represented on those charts. She saw men stepping off the truths that are represented on those charts, saying there's a better way. She saw the men that were on the platform exhorting them to get back on the platform, and some of them did. But as soon as she's talking about this crisis over the foundational truths, she moves into a history, the history of Christ, where there was a progressive testing process. And she says, those that didn't receive the teachings of John the Baptist couldn't be benefited by Jesus. They rejected the message of Jesus. What can you do? And ultimately, the Jews are left in perfect darkness. And as soon as she describes this history in the next paragraph, she says this. And I know I left off a couple sentences. Many look with, look with horror at the course of the Jews in rejecting and crucifying Christ. And as they read the history of his shameful abuse, they think they love him and would not have denied him as did Peter or crucified him as did the Jews. The God who reads the hearts of all has brought to the test that love for Jesus which they profess to feel. All have been watched with the deepest interest the reception of the first angel's message. 
But many who profess to love Jesus and who shed tears as they read the story of the cross derided the good news of his coming. Instead of receiving the message with gladness, they declared it to be a delusion. They hated those who loved his appearing and shut them out of the churches. That's the second angel's message. Those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second, neither were they benefited by the midnight cry, which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And by rejecting the two former messages, they have so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third angel's message, which shows the way into the most holy place. I saw that as the Jews crucified Christ, so the nominal churches had crucified these message, and therefore they have no knowledge of the way into the most holy, and they cannot be benefited by the intercession of Jesus there. Like the Jews who offered their useless sacrifices, they offer up their useless prayers to an apartment that Jesus has left. And Satan is pleased with his deception, assumes a religious character, and leads the mind of these professed Christians to himself, working with his power, his signs and lying wonders, to fasten them in the snare. Now, Brothers and sisters, Sister White starts this chapter talking about the foundations and platform of Adventism, which talks about a controversy over the foundation and platform of Adventism, which is the messages that are represented on those two charts. That's where she starts this chapter. As soon as that, that paragraph's finished, she goes into a progressive testing time in the history of Christ. And as soon as, as soon as she describes the progressive testing time in the history of Christ, she goes into a progressive testing time in the history of the Millerites. If, if it can be shown that the Millerite history is repeated in the history when the 144,000 are developed, then you have the logic for understanding that there will be a progressive testing process for the 144,000 and that it will have some direct connection to the foundational truths of Adventism that are represented on those charts. Amen. A great controversy, page 393, and this isn't in your notes, Sister White says, the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. That's great controversy, 393. I think it's word for word. Be off a little bit. <laughs> The parable of the dead virgins of Matthew 25 illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. Then, in Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, Sister White says this, I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to our time. And like the third angel's message, it has been present, it's been truth, and we, the last part I'm vague, I'm a little bit fuzzy on, but will continue to be present truth to the close of time. The part that I want you to see is that Sister White says, the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. How many of you have read the Great Controversy? So you know in the Great Controversy, when Sister White's covering the Millerite history, she sets the Millerite history in the terms of a fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. When the Millerites were fulfilling the parable of the ten virgins is what Sister White was talking about here in early writings 259. As they were fulfilling the parable of the ten virgins, William Miller was bringing a message, and people were being tested by that message, and the progressive message continued until the churches closed their doors and the second angel's message arrived. When the second angel's message is empowered at the midnight cry, the testing process ex escalates. That was a fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. <coughs> Herald, August 19th, 1890, Sister White says this parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. Now, what starts the Millerite history, and we'll deal with this tomorrow, in probably a different detail than you've ever looked at, <coughs> But what starts the Millerite history <coughs> is the time of the end. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says, Thou, Daniel, still up the book even till the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. In Great Controversy, page 356, Sister White says the time of the end is 1798. 1798, the time of the end arrived. <coughs> the book of Daniel was unsealed. The many running to and fro in Daniel 12 is a Hebrew term meaning running, running to and fro in God's word. There was an increase of prophetic knowledge that took place from 1798 onward. 
that was recognized by the students of prophecy that were running to and fro in the prophetic word that was being unsealed at that time period. The, the escalation of this prophetic truth reaches a point in time where um, the Lord raises up William Miller to put the message into a package and uh, the, the message is then formalized. The message is presented on on that those charts and the history of 1840 to 1844 unfolds. There's so much to say about that that I'm running through my mind that I got to even know before you cut it off. What I want you to see is that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world, and the starting point for the Millerite history is the unsealing of the prophetic truths in the book of Dan. Okay? I think we have about 15 minutes, all right? So if we do, turn with me now, outside of your notes, to Revelation chapter 5. By the way, those of you that came in a little bit later than, than when we started, um, I'm just trying to put a, a couple things in place that we can refer to the rest of the week when we take up our, our studies more in earnest tomorrow, and so I'm, I know that I'm jumping around, um, forgive me for that. In, in Revelation chapter 4, you see God the Father sitting upon a throne, and he has a book in his hand that seals the seven seals, All right. in Revelation chapter 4, but in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, it says, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, and no one... Generally, no one argues that the one sitting on the throne here is God the Father. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book that was written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Sister White tells us plainly this book is the Bible. She also tells us in a variety of ways that the books of Daniel and Revelation are the same book. So God the Father sitting on the throne, he has the Bible in his hand that's sealed with seven seals. I'll show you those quotes in a moment. Verse 2, and I saw... A strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And brothers and sisters, if you haven't ever thought about it, please do. When we see as students, when we see a question raised in the Bible, the question is for us to think about. We're supposed to think, why is this question being asked and what is the answer? We're supposed to cause us to pause and think. Okay, so John... John hears an angel raise the question, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. Please keep that in the back of your mind. When John sees his book that sealed with seven seals, and then he comes to the conclusion through this process that nobody's able to open the book, he's so overwhelmed that he begins to cry. Why does that have to be in there? Why do we have to know that? Couldn't that verse be left out? Why do we have to know that John weeps much? It's in there. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither look thereon. And one of the elders <coughs> said unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I submit to you, in such a white plainly says that the line of the tribe of Judah is Christ. Right? He's, he's prevailed, he's the one that gets to open the book. So when you go to this, there's, there's a few things that seem important in my mind that we need to identify. Number one, what is the book? The Bible. What is it that seals up the Bible? Okay, so let's, let's look at some quotes in the Spirit of Prophecy and put this in context. Spalding McGann. Was it Megan or McGann? McGann. Spalding McGann. I hear it both ways. Page 58. When Christ came to this earth, the traditions that had been handed down from generation to generation, the human interpretation of scriptures hid from men the truth as, as, as it is in Jesus. The truth was buried beneath a mass of tradition. The spiritual import of the sacred volumes was lost. What is the sacred volume? The Bible. The spiritual import of the sacred volumes was lost, for in their unbelief men locked the door of the heavenly treasure. 
Darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people. Truth looked down from heaven to the earth, but nowhere was revealed the divine impress. A gloom like the fall of death overspread the earth. But the lion of the tribe of Judah prevailed. He opened the seal that closed the book of divine instruction. What's the book of divine instruction? It's the sacred volumes. It's the Bible who opened the book. The lion of the tribe of Judah, Christ. The world was permitted to gaze upon pure, unadulterated truth. Truth itself descended to roll back the darkness and counteract the air. A teacher was sent from heaven with the light that was to light every man that cometh into the world. There were men and women who were eagerly seeking for knowledge. I'm just going to define what the knowledge is. There were men and women that were eagerly seeking for knowledge. Why do we need to know what the knowledge is? Because in Daniel 12, 4, when it says, And at the time of the end, knowledge shall be increased. In verse 10, it says, The wise will understand this knowledge, but the wicked will not understand this knowledge. And in the next book in the Bible, in Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people are destroyed from the lack of knowledge. So whatever this knowledge is, it's life or death. And when it comes into history, <clears throat> it produces two classes of worshipers, the wise and the wicked. And the wicked don't understand the knowledge, but the wise don't understand the knowledge. That's based upon Daniel 12. So when Sister White's talking about the unsealing, that's what she's talking about here, the unsealing of the Bible, in Daniel chapter 12, when the book of Daniel is unsealed and knowledge is increased, that's what she's speaking about here. She says, a teacher was sent from heaven with the light that is was to light every man that comes into the world. There were men and women who were eagerly seeking for knowledge, the sure word of prophecy. And when it came, it was as a light shining in a dark place. So, whether you caught it or not here at the beginning, she told us what seals up the Bible. And Sister White talks about certain periods and times when the Bible is sealed up. Sealed up during, where she's referring to here, during when Christ was on earth, the Bible had been sealed to the Jews, it was sealed up during the Dark Ages. And she said at the beginning of this quote, what sealed it up was, when, when Christ came to this earth, the traditions that had been handed down from generation to generation, the human interpretation of Scripture, <coughs> hid from men the truth as is in Jesus. What seals up the Bible are traditions and customs that are handed down from generation to generation. Another quote, Signs of the Times, May 17, 1905, says, The scribes and the Pharisees profess to explain the Scriptures but they explained them in accordance with their own ideas and traditions. Their customs and maxims became more and more exacting. In a spiritual sense, the sacred word became to the people as a sealed book, closed to their comprehension. So, there's in Revelation chapter 5 here. And, okay, I see too many eyes closing now. I have to stop and make sure everyone's eyes get opened up, okay? And there was more than one, so you don't think I'm just picking on you. Um, in this passage in Revelation 5, the book that is sealed is the Bible. What seals it up is the reception of customs and traditions that are handed down from generation to generation. And it's the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which is Christ, that unseals the prophetic word, produces an increase of knowledge at certain points in history when he determines that it's time to unseal that prophetic knowledge. This took place in the Millerite history. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation 10, verse 1, it says this. And if you have an Ellen White Study Bible, you will have her comments on Revelation 10 at the bottom of the page. If you don't, you can find these comments in Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 971, or in Selected Messages, Book 2, page 104. I'm going to read a few verses in Revelation 10, and I'm going to tell you what Sister White says about certain symbols in Revelation 10. Verse 1 of Revelation 10 says, I, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. And Sister White says, This mighty angel is no less a personage than Jesus Christ. But this angel here is Jesus Christ. Clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars 
of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. Sister White says the little book open is the book of Daniel. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And Sister White says the fact that he put one foot upon the earth and one foot upon the sea represents a worldwide message. Verse 3 says, And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roared. Now, brothers and sisters, there's only one place in the book of Revelation where Christ is represented as a lion. And we just looked at it. It's chapter 5. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Sister White tells us that the lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 5 is Christ. And she tells us this mighty angel in Revelation 10 is Christ. And here in verse 3, Christ cries as a lion. So the student of prophecy needs to understand that when he cries at a, as a lion, it doesn't say he cries as a dog or he cries as a cow. It says he cries as a lion. That's a connection with what he has been represented as in chapter 5. And in chapter 5 of Revelation, as the lion of the tribe of Judah, what he was doing is unsealing the book that was sealed, the seven seals. In fact, when you have to take the time to look closely at Revelation chapter 5, the unsealing that takes place in chapter 5 is the unsealing of the book of Daniel. And the pioneers of Adventism, they understood that each of those seals represented a specific history, and it was those understanding that led them to produce those charts. The unsealing in Revelation chapter 5 of the Bible by Christ is a parallel passage in Revelation to the unsealing of the book of Daniel that was sealed up in Daniel chapter 12 till the time of the end. But, in verse 3 of Revelation 10, after Christ comes down with the book of Daniel open in his hand, he cries with a loud, loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he <laughs> cried, seven thunders uttered their voices, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. This is the only verse, the, book, the only passage in the <coughs> Revelation where there's anything sealed up. Whatever the seven thunders are, it is sealed up here. And in the comments on the seven thunders from Sister White, I want to read this to you. She says this. After these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. Notice that Sister White here is saying that the sealing up of the seven thunders is a parallel to the sealing up of the book of Daniel. I'm not saying it, she's saying it. After these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. So the sealing up of the seven thunders is paralleling the sealing up of the book of Daniel. Okay. Um, Sister White also says that the seven thunders here represent two histories. She says, after the seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John and to Daniel in regard to the little book, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. These relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. And Sister White wrote this in 1901. So these seven thunders symbolically represent future events, some events that take place after 1901. But in the next paragraph, two paragraphs actually, later in this passage, she says, the special light given to John which was expressed in the seven thunders was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angels' messages. Sister White says the seven thunders represent the history of the Millerites from 1840 to 1844, and it also represents the history when the 144,000 are developed. We will show that to you tomorrow. It's the same thing that she says about the parable of the ten virgins. The parable of the ten virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. It was fulfilled to the very letter in the Millerite history. It's going to be fulfilled in the history of the development of the 144,000. And the seven thunders is teaching the same thing. The seven thunders represent a delineation of the events that transpired under the first and second angel's message. She doesn't say the first, second, and third. She says the first and second angel's message. She says it also represents future events that will be disclosed in their order. But the seven thunders were sealed up, just like the book of Daniel was sealed up. So we'll go to Revelation 22 of 11. <coughs> 
Revelation 22, 11 is a familiar verse to Seventh-day Adventists. It says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. What is this verse identifying? Close of, Close of human probation, correct? Every, does everyone agree with that? Say amen. 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 Let's look Let's look at what happens just before the close of probation in verse 10. It says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. There comes a point just before the close of probation where there comes a pronouncement saying, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, this book being the book of Revelation, and there's only one prophecy in Revelation that is sealed up at that time, and it's the seven thunders. And the unsealing of the seven thunders brings about the same experience that was produced in the Millerite history when the book of Daniel was unsealed, because the Millerite history was repeated to the very letter. And Sister White says, now, one of the things the seven thunders represents is the delineation of events that transpired under the first and second angel's messages. But in verse 4 of Revelation 10, the seven thunders were sealed up. And what seals up God's prophetic word, brothers and sisters, is the reception of customs and traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation. I'm going to walk over to the charts one more time as we close for you that are running the camera if it's important to you. Now, there was a time a couple years ago when I asked this question that virtually no hands would go up. But in this audience, we may get more hands than normal. But brothers and sisters, how many of us here this evening are prepared to give a Bible study to a non-Seventh-day Adventist tomorrow afternoon on the 2520 time prophecy? Leviticus 26. Raise your hands high. Look around. Brothers and sisters, what was the first time prophecy that William Miller discovered? It was the 2520. According to William Miller, it was this time prophecy that led him to the 2300 year prophecy. Every Millerite preacher preached the 2520. But here we are at the end of the world. And these foundational truths have been sealed up to us through the receptions of customs and traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation. All the Millerites knew what the 2520 was. But we don't. Because it's been sealed up. But the fact that we're discussing it right here, right now, is identifying that the line of the tribe of Judah is now unsealing what the seven thunders represent, because the seven thunders represent a delineation of events that transpired in the first and second angels' messages, and this is the mes message that took place in that history. And by returning to come to understand these foundational truths, we will be fulfilling Isaiah 58, 12. We will be returning to the old past and ra raising up the foundations of many generations. This is the foundation of the Millerites. This is the foundation of Adventism. And when Sister White told her husband to correct the, the errors on this chart, the error on this chart, if you look closely at this chart, this is the chart that was produced to correct the errors that she says God was in the publishment of this chart, and there's a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. Right down here, you can read that they're still teaching the 2520. Now, I'm not, this isn't a presentation strictly on the 2520. I'm simply using the 2520 to emphasize that the foundational truths that were established in the first and second angel's message time period are sealed up to God's people at the end of the world. Through the reception of customs and traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation. And brothers and sisters, where we started tonight, some of you missed. But where we started tonight was <coughs> there's earthquakes going on. There's wars going on. There's hurricanes going on. There's tornadoes going on. The economy's going down. Countries are preparing for war. <coughs> All these external evidences are teaching us that probation's about to close. And according to Revelation 22, verses 10 and 11, just before the close of probation, the prophecy that has been sealed up in the book of Revelation, which is the seven thunders, is to be unsealed. And it's going to produce the same experience that took place in the Millerites. 
brothers and sisters, we need to understand this. Okay. We will begin looking more closely at that. Um, shall we pray? Brother Duane, did you have a closing question? Glory, Father in heaven. You set before the people of God an open door, and uh, we thank you, Lord, that the, the world is here. Uh, message presented to the people of God, and uh, the people receive it, it will be comparable to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Forgive us, Lord, for our unrighteousness of your Son, who is Lord of Washington, and the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord, to receive his testimony. And that, Lord, we will uh, walk such a session because he has given so much. He's done so much for the church and for us in the We bless Jeff. We bless the men. Mm -hmm. We bless the remaining uh, meetings that we will have. Thank you for the Sabbath hour. And help us, Lord, to keep it holy. Mm -hmm. Go with each one of these. Go home tonight and return tomorrow. And, uh, and give us a safe travel home. Mm -hmm. And our families, Lord, we want to present them before you tonight, uh, that they would be saved at last. And that Jesus wants to be the Savior. So in his name we pray. Amen. Before you, you have, I just have one closing talk. I know some of the criticisms that are thrown over this particular presentation. That's one thought to think about. What's the Bible say is the foundation? Only foundation that no man can build on any other foundation. Right? So, so you're talking about the foundation of that. Um, there are some that that don't see Christ in that, and uh, they are. And do they, you, you think I'm misrepresenting that? But there's more than you realize, brothers and sisters. When Christ walked with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, He was right there with them, and they didn't see it. It's easy to look at the prophetic truths and not see Christ in it if you don't have your eyes open to see Christ. And we're talking about the foundations of Adventism, and we're going through the nuts and bolts of prophecy. That does not mean that that isn't Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.